Ben Neal, and I'm the director of the Perlmutter Cancer Center at NYU Langone Health, and I want to welcome all of you um, to our second live information session uh, focused on the issues uh, surrounding the COVID-19 epidemic and cancer care. If we can go to the next slide, um, you can't see us, but you can see our pictures. So I'd like to introduce myself a little bit more in detail and then ask each of my uh, co-panelists to, uh, to say a little bit about themselves. So um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a, uh, you know, a trained physician scientist, although I spend most of my time um, you know, doing the basic research side and running the cancer center. I've been at NYU Langone Health for a little over five years, and I'm responsible for uh, all of the cancer center across our multiple sites in, 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 in uh, five, four boroughs of Manhattan and also uh, Long Island. Um, and uh, Abe, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I am uh, the medical director of the Clinical Cancer Center, and above all, I am a medical oncologist who treats patients with lung cancer. Wait a second, I thought above all, you're Dr. Handsome on Dr. Radio. Uh, I, I was going to let you just introduce me that way, yes, but uh, I fell sure. down yeah. on the job again. But that, that means I, I, was, I was looking forward to the opportunity for you to introduce me by my tag name. Dr. Wonderful, I'm yes. sure people all know that already. Okay, well, thank you so much. So, Dr. Grossbard, would you like to introduce yourself? Or I thought your tag name was Mr. April 15th. Um, <laughs> that's not even, that's only funny the insiders. So yeah, I got it. Um, uh, I'm the second chief of hematology uh, at the uh, uh, Kish campus and also direct the inpatient service. So unfortunately, uh, Dr. Allendorf uh, is unable to join us uh, because he had another co uh, commitment. So, uh, Dr. Chalice, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm Eva Chalice. Uh, I'm a gynecologic oncologist um, who is clinically active and also um, participate in clinical trials. And I'm physician director at the Promoter Cancer Center at NYU Winthrop. And Dr. Schneider. Uh, Jeff Schneider, I'm uh, the Chief of Hematology and Medical Oncology at uh, NYU Winthrop, which is a recent uh, uh, um, partner with the Promoter Cancer Center in the city. A little known fact is that uh, I did my residency at NYU when uh, a Tichua was there, so we go back uh, many, many moons to, to that time, and I did my medical school as an anatomy dissection partner with Mike Grossbart. Uh, so, uh, it's been a nice reunion uh, with uh, colleagues uh, in Manhattan. Okay, so with that introduction, um, let me just tell you that this is not meant to be a monologue. We want to take your questions because I know that a lot of you have questions. Uh, we already have a lineup of questions that were sent last time that we didn't get to answer. Um, but if you want to ask a question during the webinar, please uh, email cancerevents at nyulangone.org. Um, you can also use the, the uh, question and answer box that's at the right-hand lower corner of, uh, of the, uh, the webinar, uh, the WebEx, or you can call 1-833-263-2266. And I just am noting for my colleague, Dr. Chichua, it's 1-833-263-2266, and that phone line will be manned or personed. Okay, so can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, I'm sure that I don't have to tell anybody on this call that the COVID-19 epic epidemic, um, or I guess I should more accurately say pandemic, has had a major impact on all aspects of, uh, of society in the United States. But uh, I think it's also been increasingly clear to many um, that there's been a serious epidemic of, uh, a serious impact of COVID-19 on cancer care. And um, these are just a few snapshots of, uh, of uh, recent publications, both in professional venues and, and also have been reported in the press, indicating a serious concern that um, we share at the Perlmutter Cancer Center that cancer patients may not be accessing the cancer care that they need during this epidemic. And we're also aware, and we'll have a lot more to say about that during this, this webinar, um, that there are issues about the risk, the specific risks to cancer patients of getting COVID-19 and how that impacts on cancer care. 
So uh, let me just say that we're we're going to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, in this you know hour or so going over many of these issues. But I just wanted to mention that we are concerned that that now many people have deferred potentially suspicious uh, conditions that ordinarily might prompt them to go to their primary care physician uh, and get evaluated for uh, potential cancer. So we wanted to know, and we're also aware that many primary practices, in fact, most are shut down and you can't access uh, those uh, providers. So we just wanna mention that uh, in response to this epidemic, we've started a new program that we call the, Suspe the uh, Suspicion of, Vir of Cancer Virtual Clinic. And you can access this by, uh, this is available both to uh, our, our existing patients, but also to new patients. And it allows you to have a, an immediate video visit with an experienced uh, oncology nurse practitioner um, so there's a couple of different ways to access this. So you can call this number here, 212-731-6196, or you can go directly uh, uh, to the web, uh, uh, myulangone.org slash cancer suspicion, uh, or you can also just type in that little uh, URL at the bottom there. And this will connect you uh, with uh, an, uh, uh, a professional who will be able to tell you um, what to do with your with your concerns, and um, as I said, we've instituted this, uh, you know, in response to the COVID epidemic. Um, but we probably will continue this going forward because we know that many times patients are concerned and and maybe they want to have a consultation, uh, you know, over the web or over the phone before um, consulting with a, a physician or a, another uh, advanced practice provider in, in person. So next slide, please. Okay, so let me tell you uh, for the patients who we already do have, or for patients who are coming to one of our multiple Perlmutter Cancer Center sites, what we are doing to keep our patients safe. Uh, so the first, the, the, there's really a number of things that we're doing, and we're gonna go into detail about, uh, about many of them. So the first thing is that we're screening and testing patients, staff, and faculty uh, for COVID-19. So to try to, as best as we can, keep the cancer center sites free of COVID and therefore limit the risk of patients um, getting infected uh, when they visit the cancer center. Also, I just wanna emphasize that all of our PCC clinics for medical oncology um, and most of our access to radiation oncology uh, or much of our access to radiation oncology, although not all of it, is physically distant from the main NYU Langone Hospital. Uh, I know a lot of people read about all the COVID patients. We've got a lot of things going on in our hospitals also to segregate people who have COVID from people who don't have COVID. But most of our medical, uh, most of our other facilities are separate from the hospital physically, often by several blocks or miles. We also have uh, redesigned our uh, clinics to facilitate social distancing. We've decreased uh, the size of the waiting rooms. We've decreased the occupancy, uh, not the size of it, we've decreased the spacing in the waiting rooms, increased the spacing so that people aren't sitting as close. And we've also uh, decreased the number of people in the cancer center at all times. Um, we're also, uh, cre we've also created what we call inpatient safe hubs where our cancer patients are housed separate from anybody who uh, is either suspicious for or has documented COVID, COVID uh, infection. And I just wanna emphasize that we are a big network. We have three uh, hospital sites and numerous satellite sites, but we have exactly the same procedures and exactly the same standards across our network. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, what about cancer surgery and other procedures? So. Uh, Dr. Allendorf was supposed to handle this, but since he can't call in, I'm gonna ask Dr. Shalas, who's also a surgeon, um, to weigh in on this. And maybe Drs. Chichua, Schneider, and, and uh, Grossbart might wanna say something about other procedures as well. So Eva, do you wanna say something? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Neal. I think first uh, and foremost, um, operating rooms are clearly um, uh, sterile uh, environments and uh, have been kept that way you know, throughout. Um, our patients are getting tested um, prior to surgery. Um, the outpatient surgeries are taking priorities right now and cancer patients are taking priorities as we begin to reopen access to operating rooms. 
Um, and as you already heard Dr. Neal state before, uh, faculty and staff are all getting tested. So we're adhering to, uh, of course, all of the standard operating procedures, which is appropriate use of uh, uh, personal protective equipment for both us and the patients and uh, maintaining a sterile environment. Um, so it, we believe uh, based on our experience that the patients are in a safe environment and protected. You wanna say something about procedures uh, that we're doing? And by the way, um, we are, as Dr. Chalice said, opening up outpatient facilities, uh, more outpatient surgery and things like that than before. But um, we never, at, at least at the main campus, never absolutely stopped all cancer surgeries. We feel that if there, it's always a risk benefit um, decision. And if it's necessary for someone to get surgery, even over the last several weeks, people have been operated on, um, you know, because cancer doesn't stop because of COVID. So, uh, Abe or Michael, do you want to say anything about procedures? So, I think, uh, I think if I could say that uh, the same applies for any procedures, biopsies, endoscopies, uh, the workflow is the same. Uh, patients have a pre-procedure COVID test, uh, and then they can undergo the procedure. And we'll talk a little bit uh, later on in the program about what happens if the test is positive. But for now, we've taken every precaution to try and keep our patients safe during surgery, during procedures, and during chemotherapy treatment, as will become obvious a little bit later. Right, so let's go on and we'll tell you a little bit more detail about a lot of these things. Let me just say one thing, a lot of people have asked about clinical trials, including some questions that we've got. Um, can I ask my fellow uh, participants and everyone else to please mute in between um, when you're called on? Thank you. So what about clinical trials? So uh, we actually have never stopped our clinical trials completely at the Cancer Center. What we've done is throughout the entire uh, epidemic, we've continued um, to offer clinical trials that involve the delivery of a new agent. Let's call it experimental agent X. Um, if it is normally given either at the same time as the standard therapy would be given or given in addition to the standard of care. So if the patient would normally get the standard of care on week two and the clinical trial says, that you get the standard of care plus X, or you get X instead of the standard of care, that um, that patient that trial continues, and patients are still eligible to come in, and, and many of them have continued on those trials. We have also continued some of our phase one trials with agents that have already shown that they may be significantly beneficial to patients. So we don't want to deny patients potential benefits um, from the trials. Um, now, we have actually taken many steps to uh, limit risks for patients who are coming in for trials. So, for example, um, we've eliminated some of the draw blood draws that are normally done with clinical trials um, where possible. Um, we've eliminated um, unnecessary, um, optional biopsies and, and procedures like that. And some trials that, um, you know, we did not, where we felt uh, many additional trips to the hospital would be necessary um, we have put those trials uh, on hold. Now, going forward, um, we are, uh, as the number of cases uh, in the city and the number of cases in our hospitals um, and across the area um, winds its way down, we are making plans to reactivate many more of our um, exciting cutting edge clinical trials. But I wanna emphasize that we're doing this um, with the expectation and um, the preparation to make our facilities very safe for patients to come in and be on those trials. So we're hoping that, you know, by the early summer, at least, um, we'll have um, gotten our clinical trial portfolio, which is quite um, large and robust, um, back up um, towards its normal level. Um, but every one of these decisions is made very carefully with a lot of consultation involving everyone on this phone call and others um, on a very frequent basis um, to try to make sure that we're doing the best um, that we can for everyone concerned. Okay, next slide. Uh, yeah. I also add uh, a small percentage of patients uh, are treated on inpatient trials. We did have to put those on pause for a while, but uh, I think we're all pleased to announce that we now have restored parts of the hospital to COVID-free floors. And our hematology oncology floor, both our hematologic malignancy floor and our oncology floor are now not uh, places where there are COVID patients 
and we've been able to reopen access to inpatient trials also. And I just want to make, make uh, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with our Manhattan site, it's, uh, you know, a very, you know, cutting edge state of the art facility. And, um, you know, it's very, uh, you know, the rooms have been, are needed of pressure. It's very safe um, in any event, but it's particularly safe because we've ensured that it's COVID free. Okay, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, screening. So we uh, do multiple levels of screening to try to limit the chances that someone comes into our cancer center uh, who's infected with COVID. So the first thing is that patients are all called, uh, contacted prior to their visit and screened uh, you know, with a battery of questions for whether they could be potentially COVID infected. And then everyone has their temperature taken at the door. And that doesn't just include um, patients, that includes all of our employees and staff. Everyone has to have their um, pay their temperature taken and be screened just like the patients so um, so that we are doing uh, the best we can to make sure no one is infected. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what those screening questions are in a little bit. Um, we maintain very strict social distancing inside the cancer center. Of course, we have all of the necessary personal protective equipment um, for patients and staff. All patients are given a mask um, at the door and they're expected to wear that mask throughout their visit unless there's some medical reason why it has to come off. Likewise, staff have a mask that they are uh, required to wear in the cancer center at all times. And we also have a ongoing, extremely rigorous cleaning and disinfection protocol for common surfaces, being aware that um, COVID can live on some, the virus that causes COVID can live on surfaces for a considerable period of time. So I think all of these things, you know, each one of them by themselves has potential flaws. But if you combine all of these with the fact that we're also tested, we've also tested all the staff and we um, are going to be testing patients, some patients, um, this is also, uh, you know, uh, I think additional levels of safety. Next. Okay, so uh, here are, you know, the actual questions that you will be asked if you come to any PCC site uh, across uh, Long Island or, um, the, or New York City. So the first is you'll be asked whether you have tested positive for COVID-19, uh, whether uh, any of your close family members or direct uh, contacts had fever, cough, or tested positive for COVID-19 in the last five days, or have you had any contact with a family member or close contact who has been exposed to the coronavirus. And we'll, you'll also be asked specifically about certain symptoms. Um, we update these symptoms regularly as we learn new information of, uh, about the spectrum of, uh, of symptoms that people can have with this disease. And in fact, um, this was just updated last week because of new information from the uh, CDC um, about the most common symptoms that manifest themselves with, that manifest in this disease in the United States. So obviously fever, um, the fever that's associated with COVID-19 can actually be reasonably low. So we actually ask for any fever uh, of 99.5 uh, or above. Uh, also uh, potential fever associated symptoms like chills and sweating. Um, any new cough, any uh, trouble breathing or shortness of breath, um, new shaking chills. So um, apparently, um, you know, this is a very common manifestation of, uh, of the disease is very, is sh the really ch teeth chattering chills, uh, any new muscle aches or pain, sore throat, headache, or new loss of smell or taste, um, and, uh, or a change in taste. So these are the, you'll be asked about all of those. So then the next slide. So what happens if you screen positively? So uh, you'll be asked, um, you'll be, you know, escorted to a, a, a screening room where you'll be uh, asked a series of follow-up questions um, by a nurse practitioner. And then you'll be evaluated by uh, a physician or a nurse practitioner for whether it's safe to come up. And ultimately, the decision about whether you um, can enter the cancer center will be made by what we call the site director. So for example, Dr. Chichua is the site director for our 34th Street site. Dr. Schneider is the site director at, um, at NYU Winthrop. Dr. Grossbard is the site director at 38th Street. So it's a very careful, multi-tiered 
screening and evaluation program to make sure that we do the best that we can to make sure no one with COVID infection um, who could infect others comes to our centers. Next. Okay, so let me uh, uh, tell you a little bit about COVID, what we do for COVID-19 testing. So first of all, there's a lot of confusion out there um, about the types of tests that exist for COVID. They basically, all COVID tests today can be divided into two general categories, PCR tests, which test for the presence of the viral RNA and therefore test indirectly for the presence of the virus. And these are tests, these are the famous nasal swab tests um, where you, know, you uh, get an answer you know, anywhere between, depending on the test, an hour and several days, you know, if you send it to a, a commercial lab. These tests tell you whether you are actively infected with COVID-19 and therefore potentially contagious. Um, the problems with these tests are that they, you know, we don't uh, have an infinite capacity to run these tests because of shortages of supplies. Um, and the other problem with these tests is that, um, you know, there are some false negatives. So if your virus titer is not that high, um, you, which means the amount of virus particles is not that high, you may not test positive. Um, also, you can continue sometimes to have viral RNA for a long period after you are positive. So we're aware of all of these you know, uh, issues and we take them into consideration in terms of making a decision about what the test means. The other kind of test is, is the so-called antibody test or antibody tests. And what these antibody tests measure is not whether you have active virus, they measure whether you had viral infection at some point in time. And these antibody tests fall into two general categories. They're called ELISA tests, that's spelled E-L-I-S-A. And ELISA tests are quantitative. They allow us to tell how much of a particular antibody you have in your blood. And they, they're, it's a little complicated because there's ELISA tests that recognize different proteins um, in, in, that the coronavirus makes. So one major protein is called the spike protein. So the spike protein of coronavirus, when you've seen these pictures of the virus, that's that red, those are those red spikes that are sticking out from the virus. That's the spike protein. Um, the spike protein is what the virus uses to attach to cells and get into the cells and infect you. And in antibo some antibodies that are directed against the spike protein would basically bind to the same part of the spike protein that binds to cells and therefore should block infection, but not all antibodies that bind to the spike protein um, block infection. And therefore, the fact that you have antibodies does not absolutely prove that you are immune to the virus, but it proves that you were at one point, if it's a good test, if it's a very active, validated, highly specific test, it proves that at one point you were infected and your body raised an immune response. And we believe that people who have a good titer to, you know, the spike protein are likely to have some immunity to the virus. Although I want to hesitate, I said believe, I did not say no, because we do not know that yet. And it's not that we at Perlmutter Cancer Center don't know that, it's we, the world of science, does not really absolutely know that. The second kind of, the second antibody test is against a protein called the nucleocapsid protein or the capsid protein. That's a protein that coats the RNA and it's inside the viral particle. So it's inside that beautiful spiked structure that you see there. And that doesn't become revealed until after the virus gets into the cell and exposes itself. So that your body makes antibodies against that too because some lung cells or other cells that are infected with the virus die and your body makes antibodies against that uh, protein. Those antibodies cannot be neutralizing because they recognize a part of the protein that is never exposed. But most, it appears from initial studies by many labs that there's a high correlation between whether you have antibodies to either protein and the other antibodies. So in other words, if you have high titers, high, high, high amounts of, a vir of antibodies against the capsid protein, you almost always have high titers against the spike protein too. So they, they sort of are what we would call surrogates of one another. But again, these tests each one of these tests, there's a number of them, have different degrees of reliability. Several of them measure different things and they have to be uh, taken with you know, a professional's insight. Okay, so we test 
what the testing that we're doing at the cancer center right now is the PCR test because for us, the most important question in terms of deciding what to do with a patient is whether you could have active virus. So we test our providers and we test patients. So all of the providers at our centers have now been tested within the last week. And um, we're beginning testing um, uh, patients uh, um, as we speak. Next slide. Okay, so what happens if you test positive during treatment? Well, we'll have some more of these questions along the way, but I'm gonna turn this answer over to somebody who actually sees uh, patients with COVID. So Dr. Chichua, would you like to say something about this issue? What happens if you're COVID positive? Uh, yeah. So there are a couple of situations that we can talk about. Number one is if you're during, if you're getting treatment and you suffer from a COVID infection and then you recover um, the, and, you, and you have no big complications, like you're not in the hospital, not in ICU, et cetera. So the first question that comes up is when can you resume chemotherapy or immunotherapy for cancer? Uh, so, what we have decided and is consistent with multiple other uh, places is not to resume chemotherapy for at least 14 days from the resolution of symptoms. Uh, this is designed so that the patients are kept safer, that immune suppression doesn't reactivate any problems that are unexpected. We are still struggling a little bit with what to do on patients with immune therapy because COVID can cause lung inflammation and immune therapy can also activate lung inflammation. So we're asking for a CAT scan to be done uh, to, to before we begin immunotherapy to make sure there's no lung inflammation. So if you happen to be uh, getting treatment, you get COVID, you recover from COVID, you can go back on treatment uh, but the question is, how do we make it safest for you? Uh, and that's how we designed it. Um, the other thing that's important to know is, you know, as Ben mentioned, the, and I've had several patients ask me about this, do they need to wait for viral clearance before they can resume treatment? So I have sev pa several patients that go and have repeated nasal swabs. And the point to make about that is that the nasal swab can be positive up to at least a month, maybe longer, and it doesn't mean that you're infected still. Uh, it's because, you know, infectivity is gone uh, fairly quickly after you're infected. So we don't depend on that. We don't retest patients to make sure they cleared. This may change once we have a good antibody test. So I that's, uh, say, that's uh, sorry. I want to say a little bit about that, just a little follow up on the, on the details. So the data so far, suggests that you can definitely, as Dr. Chishua says, stay positive for quite a bit of time with the PCR test, but no one has ever been able to demonstrate any active virus. So that's, that's by testing whether the, you can actually find virus that can infect cells and make more virus. No one has found any active virus after eight days of infection. So this, this, these two different observations have led to a lot of confusion, okay? Because people, you know, um, you know, have uh, tested, you know, you're, when you test positive at 14 days or 15 days, you probably are right on the margin of the test. And so then some people have tested negative and tested positive again, and that's led to some reports that you can be reinfected with COVID. Um, there are no really compelling data that show that you can be reinfected. Now, the absence of proof is not proof of absence, but right now, there's no data that once you've had the infection and cleared it, that you can be reinfected with any, within a reasonable, you know, within some short period of time. There's lots of questions about how long immunity will last if you've been infected with COVID and gotten and recovered and uh, developed an immune response. Um, but what's not questioned, at least right now, is that you will, that if you recover, you probably do have some um, level of immunity for some period of time, usually at least with most of the other viruses of the class, at least six to, uh, to 12 months. Um, and for other viruses in this class, it can be lifelong. So it's, it's not known yet how long it will be for this virus, but it's definitely not, you know, that it goes away and you can be serially reinfected. At least we don't think that's true right now. Next. Oh, you want to say something about, did somebody want to say something about radiation oncology treatment or surgery during, uh, if you're COVID positive? I can talk about surgery. Um, patients who are COVID positive and need to have surgery will receive surgery 
Uh, we have uh, separate locations where those patients are operated on. So again, we have separation between patients who, have, who test negative and those who test positive. So there's no commingling. And patients who are negative do not have to worry that they'll be infected. Um, you know, clearly in that situation, if a patient is COVID positive, there's a very high risk of transmission to of the virus to the anesthesiologist. And there are special preparations that have been made to minimize that because when the anesthesiologist goes to put the tube into the throat, that's considered an aerosolizing um, procedure. Um, the surgeons also and the staff in the room do wear the N95 masks, which protect them. And then they have on top of those masks, they also have the normal surgical masks with the um, with the eye guards uh, to protect them. So um, if you need an operation and you happen to be COVID positive and you, that operation must be carried out uh, at that time, then um, it will it will happen. We don't have the same thing for. And it's the same thing for radiation oncology. If you have an urgent need for radiation, COVID positive, you'll still be treated. Uh, we'll be treating you at the end of the day so that the, the area can be can be uh, made safe and cleaned afterwards. Um, if you're COVID positive and you have a disease that can wait two weeks to be treated, then you can wait. There are a lot of things that, that aren't urgent in radiation or in chemotherapy or in surgery. And so the same principles apply. If it's urgent and needs to be done, we'll do what's right for you medically. Okay, so let's go on to your questions now. I think we've covered uh, what we think. So um, if you are a 20 year survivor, um, do you have a, a weakened immune system? So uh, if you, first of all, whoever wrote that question, congratulations on being a 20 year cancer sur survivor. That's really great. Uh, in answer to that question, a little bit depends on you know, what your general medical condition is and whether, and what your original disease was, um, but, and, and also how old you are in general. So if you're a 20 year cancer survivor, unless you had a pediatric cancer, you know, you're probably in the age group that's has a little bit of a weakened immune system. But in general, if you had, for example, uncomplicated breast cancer or uncomplicated colon cancer, um, you know, where something was just removed, a tumor was just removed, there is no reason to believe that you have a weakened immune system beyond what you would normally have for that age and your other medical conditions. Next slide. Next question. So uh, we've talked about this, uh, the, how has it affected the various clinical trials? Many of our trials have been able to continue at some level. Some of them have been paused, um, you know, and we hope to, and the inpatient uh, trials, as Dr. Grossbart said, have been, have been stopped temporarily. As I said, we're hoping to be able to ramp those back up, you know, over the next six to 12 weeks next. Um, okay, uh, will, when will NYU be testing anybody for antibodies and what progress has been made regarding a blood test for COVID-19? So I just wanna clarify, I lumped these, there were, there were actually two questions here and I put them together because I'm pretty sure that whoever asked this question, um, uh, you know, was interested in, uh, in an antibody in antibody test. So the blood test, the, the, the test that's in the, that uses blood is the is an antibody test. And um, you know, antibody testing can be obtained in the community from Quest Diagnostics, and they have two antibody tests. Um, one of which is again, both of which are ELISA tests, the type of test that I discussed earlier. One of them is directed against um, the spike protein, and that's made by a European company. And the other one is the Abic test, and that's directed against the capsid protein. NYU right now is, test, is developing uh, its own serological tests uh, that we will be validating. We don't have a defined time schedule for um, getting the antibody test. But I, I want to emphasize that at least for making decisions about cancer care, um, the antibody test is not very useful to us. Uh, and the reason for that is that the number, we already know uh, from surveys that have been done uh, in the city and the state, that the incidence of people who have actually had infections and test positive on the antibody test is somewhere on the order of 10 to 20% in the general population. So um, the likelihood that any one given cancer patient is going to test positive is not that high. And what's really important for us is to make sure that we don't have somebody who's, you know, pre-symptomatic with COVID 
and is not showing symptoms yet, but two days or three days or four days from now is you know going to test positive. So that's why we that's why we want to make sure that we test for the virus. It's the virus that's dangerous to the cancer center uh, staff. It's the virus that's dan dangerous to other uh, patients and to the patient themselves if they get a therapy that could weaken their immune system while they're infected. Um, the antibody is not so much useful. So I think, what do you see as the most effective therapy moving forward? I think that question is, what do we see as the most effective therapy for COVID-19? And you know, this is a cancer and COVID um, symposium, and none of us on the call uh, is an expert in COVID virology. Um, that being said, we can give you some general answers. So um, there's basically three types of therapy that would be helpful in the COVID epidemic and three stages of fighting the COVID virus um, that correspond to those three kinds of therapy. So the first kind of therapy is the one that maybe some of you heard about today or heard the news about today, which many of you may have heard about before today in terms of what the, 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 the agent is, is, a, is are what we call antiviral therapies. And so there's a drug called remisdevir, and this is made by Gilead. And this is an antiviral therapy that blocks the replication or the division of the virus. And um, this, vi this agent, you know, uh, Gilead just announced today that it appears to have some efficacy, um, you know, to, to lower the degree of infection if you get the drug very early in infection. That's kind of similar to another drug that we use for flu called Tamiflu. I haven't had a chance to actually read the paper yet. Maybe one of my colleagues has um, or read the announcement. So I don't really know how uh, strong the effect was, but this is not a cure. What it could do is if, it, if the data hold up in larger studies, it could indicate that if you gave this drug um, that it would lower the seriousness or decrease the seriousness of a COVID infection. It's not a cure. The second type of therapy is, is antibody therapy. And there's two types of antibody therapy, uh, one of which takes the blood from um, patients who have COVID um, and then injects that blood or the antibodies from that blood uh, into uh, a patient who has active COVID. That's also called conv convalescent patient serum. And um, you know that's completely experimental and there've only been some anecdotal reports that patients get better. Again, it's my strong feeling that that type of therapy will only be successful if administered in the early stages of infection before patients become really sick, if they're gonna become really sick. Because when they become really sick, they don't become really sick because the virus is dividing all over the place and killing cells. They become very sick because the immune system is reacting against the virus and overreacting against the virus. And, and the combination of the virus and the immune system response are damaging tissue and causing the serious complications that we've all unfortunately heard about. And then a related type of antibody is what, what we would call recombinant antibodies. And this is the, um, these are antibodies that are, um, are developed by companies like Regeneron and Lilly, and I think Pfizer also has an effort. These are antibodies that were developed in the laboratory to react against that spike protein that I told you about and would block the infection of the virus. Again, these are highly likely to be efficient only if they're given very early in the infection to lower the level of virus that gets generated during the infection. Once you have a developed viral infection, they're not likely to be as successful because you're already clearing the virus. In fact, it's the overreaction against the virus that's probably damaging. And then Again, so all of these things can maybe knock down the epidemic, but they're not going to prevent viral infection or, or what we really need, and, and I don't think that's a secret to anybody, are effective vaccines. So uh, if you ask me what do I see as the most effective therapy going forward, in the short term, I'm hopeful that this remisdevir data will turn out to be reasonably solid and or that some of these antibody therapies will also be able to hold back the, the you know, any second wave or, you know, future epidemics until we have an effective vaccine. But the only way that we're ever going to really control this infection is if we have an effective vaccine or if unfortunately enough people get infected so we develop herd immunity um, against the virus so that we, it can't spread again through another uh, round or two of infections. So next slide. 
Dr. Neil, before you go on, I think N NYU now has just opened a vaccine trial um, that will uh, that will. Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Participate and uh, and followed for two years while checking the antibody levels. Although I suspect I haven't read the uh, well. First of all, it's I'm not. I know I'm not eligible because you got to be I think between 18 and 55, and I don't think that. Um, any cancer patients are eligible. I, I haven't read the actual eligibility requirements, but I'd be really surprised if, uh, if any cancer patients were eligible for that. No, you're absolutely right. You have to be healthy. Can't have comorbidities. By the way, in terms of vaccines, there's a, at least 100 different vaccine programs in various stages of development all around the world. And the, we don't have time to discuss all the different strategies that are being used for vaccines. Um, but the one that's opening at, at our center, or has opened as of today at our center, is one of the RNA vaccines. Um, so that's uh, for, the, for, for people who have relatives who might be interested in participating in that trial. Um, you might want to look to see if, uh, if you're, I think, 18 to 55 and in good health, uh, you might want to be part of this trial. It's a Pfizer uh, trial that's in collaboration with a, uh, a company in Germany called BioNX. Okay, so. Uh, it's just uh, the, the question here is, can you defer treatment in the middle of the virus? Can you switch to chemical pills? What precautions should cancer centers be taking? Uh, can cancer patients safely receive a vaccine if one is developed? So, um, so I'm going to turn this over to uh, to uh, Michael Grossbart. Michael, are you on? Sorry, I had to get it unmuted. Um... I think we, we answered some of these earlier. Y yes, you can defer treatment in light of the virus if you need to grow more slowly than others. And it's certainly uh, certainly appropriate in many settings to delay treatment for a brief while, to put a pause in chemotherapy, even if you're on it, to extend out the interval a little bit. And so brief delays uh, are, are not a problem. And, and those can be discussed individually with the doctor. Um, in terms of switching to pills from infusion treatments, we do have some diseases, multiple myeloma is a good example, where pills can be just as effective as intravenous therapy. So we can use substitutes to avoid people coming in as frequently during the pandemic. There are other diseases like that. There are oral agents for lung cancer targeted therapies and for other diseases. So those are all options. We've talked about the uh, precautions that uh, cancer centers are taking, including ours specifically. And we've been way out in front of that and started taking our precautions from the moment we heard about the pandemic and, and have only enforced them and enhanced them since. Uh, testing we've discussed and then the safely receive a vaccine issue. Um, you know, we do know that cancer patients every year get flu vaccines and we encourage it and reduces the risk of getting the flu. Uh, presuming there's an effective vaccine for coronavirus, then cancer patients should be able to get that vaccine. Um, depending upon the type of cancer that you have, the status of the therapy you're getting, the status of your cancer, you may or may not develop an immune response to that vaccine as effectively as a healthy person. For most of the vaccines that are being developed, you should be able to at least get that vaccine. I should emphasize that all the vaccines that I'm aware of, the most, the most, the most advanced vaccines are either only part of the virus, so they're not the full virus, they're not a weakened virus, they're a part of the virus, or there are RNA vaccines that are part of the virus. So it's not like Do, Dr. Neil, may I comment on this question as well? Um, I think one of the things that's really critical when you're when we're asking these questions is to really make sure that that patient specifically discusses their situation with their physician. We have all um, uh, evaluated our patients who are on treatment and determined if it was safe to proceed or not uh, based on risk benefit ratio of delaying. And also in some instances, for example, in primary ovarian cancer, the best force form of chemotherapy is infusion. And then lastly, many of the chemical uh, chemotherapy pills also cause immunosuppression. So I think sometimes patients think that because they're on a pill, they're not immunosuppressed. Obviously, hormonal pills like tamoxifen and others uh, do not cause immunosuppression, but many of the chemotherapy pills do. Yes, and the other thing we should say is that some of the some of the uh, chemotherapy, or not, it's not really chemo, some of the targeted therapy pills can also cause lung inflammation of the type that Dr. Chichua mentioned earlier with immunotherapy. So uh, Dr. Charles is completely correct um, and we should have pointed this out earlier that this is not a decision that you can make 
you know, by yourself uh, from going to a webinar. You really need, we're, we're just answering high level theoretical questions, but the answer for any individual patient has to be in consultation with their actual physician. Next, next question. So, uh, so Dr. Chichua, I think this is uh, something that you or maybe Dr. Schneider wants to take. Let what, Jeff, can you handle that one? Sure. Let me just uh, see which question it is. So, so uh, uh, and you do. So ba yeah. yeah I, basically, uh, the uh, the question is is uh, addressing whether treatment can be uh, delayed uh, because of the vi virus. We've also no, talked about uh, you know the balance of protecting the patient uh, from the virus and protecting uh, the other patients from, the, from a patient potentially uh, that's infected with the virus and all those things balance out and uh, we, we, we do make a judgment and uh, that uh, has already frequently led to uh, a deferral of, of uh, uh, treatment with, you know, cancer therapies. What, what I think is important for the audience to, to recognize is that, you know, we like, uh, like everyone else, were caught a little bit off guard. And when, when the COVID epidemic came upon us, it was, uh, you know, it was ramping up and uh, we, uh, we, were, we were put into a situation where we were pulling back uh, what we uh, in every way we could to sort of protect people from viral infection. Uh, the, the point that, that, that is, is uh, uh, a good one for everyone to hear is that we're now clearly uh, on the, uh, the, the uh, downward trend. The numbers are, that you've heard on, on TV are, are, are numbers and graphs, but you know, for our own uh, practices, uh, it's very real. Uh, the, 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 uh, the inpatient uh, number of COVID hospital, uh, of, of COVID patients at Winthrop Hospital has dropped by about 50%, uh, and we're actually lagging behind the city. So we had a review of our, our numbers yesterday, and uh, the ICU numbers, the, the floor numbers, they're all down considerably. So we are now moving in the direction, uh, uh, rather than deferring treatment, which is the sort of the, 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 the intent of this question and what we had to do, we're now uh, moving towards uh, reestablishing treatment for patients where the treatment had to be deferred previously. So uh, it's, it's a better place to be, but we're doing it very cautiously so that we don't uh, uh, reverse the very good trend that we have uh, and the momentum that we have against the virus. Okay. Uh, let me just add, let me just add to this for a second. So this is, I think this question is not necessarily focused on COVID. Uh, and the decision about whether your cancer can be treated with immunotherapy or chemotherapy plus immunotherapy is completely dependent on your type of cancer, uh, on what the genetic markers, the biomolecular markers of the cancers look like, and it's a discussion to have with your medical oncologist. In cases where immunotherapy alone uh, can be effective, then sure, it's less toxic than combined with immunotherapy. Um, and the question is about how often do you take blood tests to see the progress of your treatment? Um, so some cancers generate markers in the blood that you can measure. Uh, these generally, depending on the cancer type, are not 100% reliable. So therefore, you can discuss that with your oncologist as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And normally, ouch, that wasn't me. Um, normally, if you, have a, if you have a blood test, for example, like a CN125 in ovarian cancer, Generally speaking, we can check them every cycle or every two cycles. But I think these are questions to discuss with your oncologist. Will answer will vary depending on the type of cancer you have and what the markers are of such cancer. Okay, so let's move on. We have some more questions. Uh, so this is a this is right up your alley too, Abe. I'm going to throw this over to you. Is the 14 day waiting period for a negative scan for inflammation? This is okay. So the the 14 day time said is for resumption of treatment after resolution of symptoms. Okay. So if you have a patient who developed COVID, symptoms got better. 14 days later, they can come into the cancer center and receive chemotherapy. 
if you have a CT scan, so the CT scan story comes with immune therapy. If you're getting immune therapy, so I would say that you should get a CT scan before you restart immune therapy. And if you have no inflammation, then you can have treatment right away. If you have lung inflammation with the concern of reactivation of such inflammation, then unfortunately you have to wait. Um, and the waiting depends on A, whether the inflammation goes away, so you will need another scan, and B, whether your blood makes, whether you have inflammatory markers in the blood that can predict that you have active inflammation. So this is a much more complicated question. 14 days, we said, for starting chemotherapy from resolution of symptoms, immunotherapy may have to wait a little bit longer depending on the CAT scan. Yeah, and again, I think the, <laughs> let me just, the, the critical point there is that you can be asymptomatic and have those signs of prior inflammation um, on the CT scan. And we've seen a couple of cases like that, and particularly radiation oncologists have seen this. Um, you know, for people who are going ongoing regular therapy, never knew they had any symptoms at all, uh, and have actually had, uh, you know, evidence of COVID infection in their lungs. And that's where we want to be very extra careful. Dr. Neil, can I, can I just clarify something? I think it's important for the audience to understand that we're talking about a CT scan of the lung. And this is not necessarily just for patients with lung cancer, but it's specifically for any patient who's receiving immunotherapy. So you could be receiving immunotherapy for melanoma or for um, colon cancer uh, or even some of the gynecologic cancers. And the, the issue is that that can cause inflammation of the lung. And that's what Dr. Chicho is, uh, is, is addressing, is that the scan is not of your whole body. It's of the lung, specifically looking to see if that inflammation has resolved related to immunotherapy. Okay, let's move on. Uh, a couple of gross barred questions. Uh, I have a stem cell transplant, gray ML, um, eight months ago. What are my risks for COVID? And I had a stem cell transplant um, for AML. So I guess they're the same question. That's a, it's not, it, maybe they're two different patients or maybe they're the same question. Similar. Yeah. Times. yeah. So uh, those are both good questions. And, and uh, uh, any given person's risk, again, is, is, goes into a combination of factors. It's, it's based on uh, other diseases they may have. It's based on age. It certainly having had a stem cell transplant does suppress the immune system. We do know that patients who are actively being treated for cancer, particularly patients with hematologic malignancies and patients with immunotherapy are at higher risk of complications from COVID, which is why we and others have taken lots of precautions to, to prevent that. It's, it's why we're doing all the things that we talked about with screening and testing and limiting visitors and all those things. So I can't put a specific risk on anything except to say that that all the doctors who are following people who've had stem cell transplants are well aware of these risks and are doing everything to optimize safety. Okay, next slide. Some breast cancer questions. So are, are women with metastatic breast cancer and in treatment at greater risk for COVID-19? Um, Jeff or, or, uh, or Abe, you wanna take a shot at this? Yeah, so so I think that that, that the, the biggest uh, increase uh, in risk related to COVID illness uh, has to do with uh, not so much getting the COVID illness. I think that, that cancer patients are not necessarily more likely to get COVID illness, uh, except by the fact that they may be uh, exposed, uh, uh, but, but the fact that their, their treatment or their disease may compromise them to the, uh, the effects of the COVID virus. So, so what I would say is that, that, that it's not more likely that you'll get COVID if you're properly socially distancing and, and taking those precautions. But if you, if you do acquire uh, COVID and, and uh, in the setting of, of, depends on exactly where the cancer is, if it's in your lungs, then that, that may predispose you to COVID pneumonia complications. Uh, but also the treatment that you get uh, can also impact the, uh, uh, the effects of, of, of the virus, and, and so it, it, you could be at more risk of complications. So I guess it depends in this particular question what kind of metastatic breast cancer the patient has and what treatment they're getting, right? Exactly. So we'd have to know that, and again, and coming back to what Dr. Chow says, um, said, it's really quite a bit important to know what the actual details are. Um, so we can only give you general answers, and uh, I guess the sort of Big take-home message is that you know 
Um, we're available to answer your questions on a personal basis through things like our, um, you know, virtual uh, uh, answer clinic that I talked about on the first page. And also just from really regular appointments, we have telemedicine appointments and we're gonna have increasing numbers of in-person appointments over the next several weeks as uh, we ramp up our, our, our practices in, in the cancer centers in person. So Ben, just as a, as a quick aside, you know, in looking, in looking at our numbers of patients that have cancer and got COVID, you know, there's very few patients with breast cancer, which means a lot of patients with breast cancer that in the city sites at least, um, very few people actually got COVID, uh, which speaks to Jeff's point. If you take particular precautions, your risk is not particularly greater uh, than, other, than anybody else. Next slide. Uh, next question. There's another question. Okay, so uh, there's actually a mastectomy question. There's a couple mastectomy questions. There's one on the Q and A session too. So uh, someone wants to. So Abe, you want to talk about this too? Abe ran some fast So yeah, this is. A, um, I I don't. I, I think Jeff may have more experience with this than me, okay. um, because I don't know much about these treatments. Jeff, can you tackle that? Yeah, let me take a look. Uh, so the last time you, 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 I was answering the top question and you, you were looking on the bottom one. So let me make sure I get, so we're on the top question now, correct? The bottom question. No, we're on the bottom women, question. Oh, no, no, we're on the bottom one. Okay, good. I'm glad I clarified that. So uh, after seven years of, okay. Uh, that's where. Uh, somebody on the internet. That one, somebody on. With X. So yeah, so, so, so the iBrands, uh, uh, again, it, it, the iBrands itself can, can lower blood counts, and so so there is a there is a, a risk of some immune compromise with Ibrance. Fazlodex will not. Fazlodex is a uh, an estrogen uh, or receptor antagonist, uh, so it doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, impact uh, on either the immune system or uh, or even uh, clotting the way some other hormonal drugs do. So so. Uh, uh, there, there, there can be effect of Ibrance, but it's minor. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not to the same extent as uh, chemotherapy. And, and your blood counts would ordinarily be uh, monitored. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the things that that, that is are true of a hormone. So this is clearly a hormonally responsive breast cancer, uh, and it's recurred very uh, after a very long time. So those tend to be, uh, you know, I, I, I tell patients in these kind of uh, categories. You know, the rich get richer. So you've lived a long time with your, uh, uh, your, your, your breast cancer, and that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, time is running out. It, it's the rich get richer that, that you've, uh, your disease has declared itself as one that is manageable and hopefully will continue to be manageable. So uh, uh, I wish you good luck with that, and I, and I think there's reason to be optimistic. Next, next, uh, next. Uh, so, okay, so we have a couple of mastectomy questions. Um, looks like it may be the same question on the, on the chat. So, well, I mean, on the, Question and answer. So, I'm having a lot of questions. How can I be sure that I'll be safe after surgery and not bring this virus home to my family with pre existing conditions? Will I need to be quarantined and who will take care of me when this happens? So, Eva, do you want to handle that? Yes, of course. I actually have been prepped by Dr. Allendorf, who's uh, sorry that he can't be here to answer them personally. But as we mentioned at the beginning of this talk uh, or this webinar, um, you know, the operating room is a sterile environment. Mastectomies are performed as an outpatient procedure, which is typically in most uh, of our hospitals is a, actually a physically separate location from the hospital. Um, these locations have never been, have never housed COVID patients. Um, so they've been COVID free from the get go. Um, and um, chances are that you'll be in the hospital just overnight and then go home. You do not need to be quarantined um, because, again, you'll be tested beforehand. Uh, you know all of the staff and the physicians have been tested so that you know you'll be in a COVID-free zone as far as um, staff and physicians are concerned. Um, and um, in terms of opening up for the surgery, obviously you're already scheduled, so we know that the, the um, uh, operating rooms are open. They're open as a priority to uh, outpatient procedures and specifically to cancer patients. Um, again, as Dr. Neal had pointed out earlier, if you have cancer and you need an operation urgently, it will be carried out um, as, as need be, but, uh, but uh, priority for the moment uh, is as we begin to ramp up 
is to uh, take care of the patients like yourself with the outpatient procedures and for diagnosis of cancer rather than outpatient procedure and some kind of elective process like cholecystectomy or gallbladder surgery. And again, having to do the second question sort of related, um, and we can just deal with that very easily, which is, yes, you will be tested prior to surgery. We mentioned that um, in uh, the beginning uh, of, the, of the chat, of the, of the webinar, and also your providers will have been tested. So yes, you will be tested. And when are the operating rooms opening up? Um, we have uh, open operating rooms now. There were breast surgeries going on um, this week at the main campus. I think Winthrop is a, you know, the Winthrop campus is a little behind. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe Abe, you want to start it? Yeah, we that we've started. Mm -hmm. And 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 Brooklyn also, I think, has uh, has some some capability. So um, again, yeah, we're just doing... to clarify, Ben, sorry that we we do the testing at NYU and any of our sites. We can't. I can't say the same for other non-NYU sites. Uh, so if that question is from an NYU patient, then the answer is yes. Uh, they'll get COVID yeah, tested yeah. free yes. I, I'm sorry, yeah, you will be tested if you're NYU. Yeah, these, these are, yeah, we're answering NYU specific here, sorry. Okay, so I think we're close to the end. Do we have any other questions? Oh yes, this this question, very long question. And I know that uh, it's, it's actually a complicated question. So this, is a, this patient has a uh, prostate cancer um, with uh, high, is what we call an intermediate risk prostate cancer. And the question is whether they should have cybernite versus surgery. Um, and uh, Dr. Chichua, as a former urology, urologic medical oncologist, uh, I think maybe you're the best person to take this. I thought it's because I had my prostate up too. So, um, okay, like, TMI, I get it. Oh, hey, um, yeah. Look, if you want, it, you want the whole world to know. <laughs> well, I, you know, I do want the whole world to know personal, because- I'm respecting your personal space. No, I, I, think, I think we are, I mean, I am also a patient of the cancer center. So You're it is very important for me to feel safe coming to the cancer center. So all these discussions are relevant to me on multiple levels. So, so that's kind of why it's relevant. Uh, however, as to this specific question, uh, so, you know, this is very difficult for us to give advice because we don't know too much about you, uh, except, you know, what you just put down on paper. And this is a decision that obviously is best made between you and your physician. If you are treated at NYU site, what we normally do is we ask for the patient to meet with surgery, uh, urologic surgery, to meet with radiation, uh, and between the two of them, there's a discussion and maybe even a presentation in a multidisciplinary tumor board before a recommendation is made. At the age of 72, surgery is not really off the table, although it wasn't so long ago that surgeons were not recommending surgery to anybody over the age of 65. Uh, but there are certain differences. For example, the radiation therapy is has a little bit less risk of incontinence after completion as opposed to surgery. So I think that it, you are on a very acceptable treatment paradigm. Uh, the frequency of visits for radiation and keeping you out of the hospital, I guess, uh, makes you a little bit less susceptible to get a COVID exposure in a hospital. Although I think that that is now changing. As we mentioned, we have COVID safe hubs in the hospital. So. I would think that your treatment recommendation is absolutely okay to proceed with. Surgery is not off the table. If you want to speak to a surgeon, you can certainly do that and get an opinion about that. It would be an acceptable alternative. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, does anybody have any other comments on it? Okay. So are there any other questions on the thing? Okay. So did, are there any questions? Uh, Dr. Neal, there was a question about visitors. Are we allowing visitors overnight? And also there was a question about PET scans and are they still performed and how are we making sure that it's safe? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Did it? These are on the Q and A. Oh, okay. So it's uh yes. Okay. Oh, right. Cause my thing a lot. Okay. PET scans. Are PET scans being scheduled? Yes, PET scans are being scheduled. Abe, you want to say something about that at our site? And maybe, uh, Dr. Chalice, you could yeah. talk about one. Time. So we, uh, we met with the radiology leadership and talked a bit about that. Uh, they are open for business. They are 
sticking with the same criteria that we have with screening. Uh, we actually ask them also to adhere to the 14-day rule of if a person uh, has developed COVID um, and, and uh, needs to have a scan, then they come in uh, 14 days from resolution of symptoms if it can wait. Uh, if obviously radiology is urgent and can't wait, then it gets done, they get scheduled a little bit later in the day, et cetera. The other, the other issue that we mentioned with radiology is, um, is uh, that there are, so this applies to radiology that is present in the cancer center building. There are other radiology sites outside of the cancer center building, and they also have precautions along the same lines, but the 14-day rule, I think that they actually don't stick to it outside of the cancer center, okay? So scans are being scheduled. Routine screening mammography is yet is not yet open in the city. It will ramp up, we think, in the next month. Uh, CT screening for lung cancer is uh, in patients at risk. It's also going to ramp up in the next few weeks. It's not yet being done. But bottom line is if a scan is needed for a medical reason, it gets done. Um, so that's my answer now. Uh, Dr. Chalice and Dr. Schneider can tell us about Winthrop as well. So uh, we are able to obtain appropriate diagnostic testing. Uh, we are using it obviously judiciously because we don't want patients to have to go to multiple sites, um, you know, visiting the doctor's office and then going to the scan. So we're also using telemedicine to a great deal for the visits and um, determining what tests need to be done. Um, no issues obtaining tests, uh, all the NYU Langone uh, um, radiology uh, uh, sites are carrying on with appropriate uh, safety measures, as are the rest of us. Okay. So uh, the next question has to do uh, with the, uh, the whether we can allow visitors overnight. So the the answer to that is unfortunately not at the present time. Let me explain something about our visitor policy. Okay. We um, have had several cases where, um, you know, prior to our no visitor policy, we did allow one visitor. And we've had several cases where visitors, you know, were, you know, didn't exactly screen correctly and ended up being infected or other cases where visitors came to the door, failed our screening and had to be sent home. And basically, as, as we try to impress uh, upon everyone throughout this, this webinar, it, our primary goal has been to maintain patient safety and staff safety throughout this entire time period. And we don't think that the risk benefit ratio, and we don't, it's not that we don't think visitors are important, we do. And all else being, we'd love to be able to have visitors come in, but we need to keep the fewest number of people in the cancer center who you know, could possibly come in contact with other people. And based on that at this time, uh, and the same is true inside the hospital. At this time, we don't think that the risk benefit ratio can allow visitors. So that's the reason. Whether that will change in the coming months, we hope so. And I wanna say one more thing at the end about what the future looks like over the next several months, because I think that maybe there's some misunderstanding about that as well. Okay, so the last question. Um, Dr. Neal, did you wanna comment on asymptomatic, um, you know, wh wh why the visitors, even if they have no symptoms, could be a potential threat? Oh, yeah, because visitors, if they're asymptomatic, they could have the virus and they could transmit it or they could, you know, it's, it's just not the, 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 uh, the risk benefit ratio is not not acceptable at this point in time. So I want to I want to just add one thing to the visitor policy, the no visitor policy. There are exceptions, right? So I think that if there is a medical reason that a patient needs a visitor with them, uh, that is that is discussed with the patient's provider, then we do allow one visitor, but it's not it's a it's exception, it's not the rule. So so I think everything else you said was correct. I just want to say, you know, we're not doing this because we want to be mean. We're doing it for safety of our staff and actually safety of the visitors. So and other patients. Okay, and the last question on the on the QA box here is uh, when do you think physicians' offices will be open for visits again? So again, I don't know what physicians we're, you're asking about. Our, we do have patients being seen at our centers today. Um, we limit those visits to, you know, 
chemotherapy visits or need to come in visits and be seen. Um, where possible, we have dealt with those visits by telemedicine. Um, over the next you know, several months, we will be having more access to in-person visits, um, but it's not gonna be like the switch will be turned and you know, we'll be back up to the full capacity that we were in January of this year. I do want to say one last thing about, you know, the, the future of uh, this epidemic. So the entire reason why um, the governor um, of this state and many others in, in the country has wisely shut down the state, okay, and enforced these stringent social districting rules is because it's very similar to the reason that we have the 14-day rule for after someone's infected. The goal here is to limit the spread of the infection and get to a point where there's less than one person being infected for every person who uh, um, has COVID. When you get to a point like that and you maintain it for some period of time, the virus level will drop so low that you know, the risk will go down to where it was in like January. There were pro the, the, latest, the latest information is that there were people in the country um, you know, in January who had COVID and we're starting to transmit it. The problem was that we weren't monitoring that, we being the, you know, the public health authorities in the country as a whole, were not monitoring for infection. So we didn't know that there was this, you know, um, burgeoning epidemic um, under the surface until it broke out. And by then there were so many people that were infected, it was too hard to control. So the hope is that, you know, if we can drive down the number of infected people below the level um, where there's one person who's getting it for every one person who has it, then we should be able to, we being the public health authority, should be able to, with adequate testing capability, um, be able to monitor to make sure that the epidemic is not coming back. And under conditions like that, there's no, there will be no reason to suspect that, you know, if you're in, you know, our clinics, even if there's many more people than there are now, there's going to be relatively little reason to suspect that you will um, be able to get the disease or transmit it to others. So, um, you know, that doesn't mean that if the, you know, if, if there's a reactivation of the infection, not reactivation, but if there's a recurrence or resurgence of infection, either because new infections are introduced from another state or another country, um, or if low level infections, you know, are allowed to spread in a community uh, below the surface and, and, and then take from that area, spread out into the larger population again without being detected, that it couldn't come back to the situation that we faced in February, I mean, in March uh, again. But the goal is to get it down to the point where we could have been in January and prevent it from getting to the point where we got to in March. So I hope that that allays some concern about the longer range prospects for, you know, for COVID, not just for cancer, but for everybody's daily life. Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, um, does anybody else on the call have any last words that they want to convey? Daphne Neal, there's one last question. Do you test physician staff every day? No, we do not test physicians and staff every day because that's, we, we first of all, it probably would be unnecessary to do it every day. Um, we would like to be able to test more frequently. Um, as soon as we get more capacity, we'll be able to do that, but right now we can't. Where did that question be? I don't see that question. I think my, my box is not running right. It's at the bottom of the box. Yeah, I don't have that one. I think that was Dr. Callis's question. Oh, that was Dr. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's not very pleasant to get tested, so I would prefer not to have it happen every day. Okay, so I want to wanna just say a parting word. Um, so I think that for, for everybody on this call, I hope we have convinced you that our patients are very precious to us. Uh, we have done everything we can with current technology to keep the cancer center safe as a safe hub for COVID. We're doing similar stuff with the inpatient. So please, if you have symptoms, if you're feeling sick, don't sit home because then the second wave is going to be the untreated cancer flood that we don't want to deal with. So please, please, please listen to yourself, listen to your body and let us know if there's any issues. Okay, that's a really important point and I think that we should end on that note. And again, thank you all for attending and please do uh, send any questions that we didn't get to in and we'll try to 
uh, get you an answer. Thank you very much. Bye.